replied Caderousse. I say I want to know why they should put Dante's in prison. I like Dante's. Dante's, your health. And he swallowed another glass of wine. Danglars saw in the muddled look of the tailor the progress of his intoxication, and turning towards Fernand said, Well, you understand there is no need to kill him. Certainly not. If, as you said just now, you have the means of having Dante's arrested, have you that means? It is to be found for the searching. But why should I meddle in the matter? It is no affair of mine. I know not why you meddle, said Fernand, seizing his arm. But this I know. You have some motive of personal hatred against Dante's. For he who himself hates is never mistaken in the sentiment of others. I! Motives of hatred against Dante's? None on my word. I saw you were unhappy, and your unhappiness interested me, that's all. But since you believe I act for my own account, adieu, my dear friend. Get out of the affair as best you may and Danglars rose as if he meant to depart. "'No, no,' said Fernand, restraining him. "'Stay. It is of very little consequence to me at the end of the matter whether you have any angry feeling or not against Dante's. I hate him. I confess it openly. Do you find the means, I will execute it, provided it is not to kill the man, for Mercedes has declared she will kill herself if Dante's is killed.' Caderousse, who had let his head drop to the table, now raised it, and looking at Fernand with his dull and fishy eyes, he said, "'Kill Dantes! Who talks of killing Dantes? I won't have him killed! I won't! He's my friend, and this morning offered to share his money with me as I shared mine with him. I won't have Dante's killed. I won't. And who said a word about killing him, muddlehead? replied Danglars. We were merely joking. Drink to his health, he added, filling Caderousse's glass, and do not interfere with us. Yes, yes, Dante's good health, said Caderousse, emptying his glass. Here's to his health, his health! Hurrah! But the means, the means, said Fernand. Have you not hit upon any? asked Danglars. No, you undertook to do so. True, replied Danglars. The French have the superiority over the Spaniards, that the Spaniards ruminate while the French invent. Do you invent, then? said Fernand impatiently. Waiter, said Danglars, pen, ink, and paper. Pen, ink, and paper, muttered Fernand. Yes, I am a supercargo. Pen, ink, and paper are my tools, and without my tools I am fit for nothing. "'Pen, ink, and paper, then,' called Fernand loudly. "'There's what you want on that table,' said the waiter. "'Bring them here.' The waiter did as he was desired. "'When one thinks,' said Caderousse, letting his hand drop on the paper, "'there is here wherewithal to kill a man more sure "'than if we waited at the corner of a wood to assassinate him.' I have always had more dread of a pen, a bottle of ink, and a sheet of paper than of a sword or a pistol. The fellow is not so drunk as he appears to be, said Danglars. Give him some more wine, Fernand. Fernand filled Caderousse's glass, who, like the confirmed topper he was, lifted his hand from the paper and seized the glass. The Catalan watched him until Caderousse, almost overcome by this fresh assault on his senses, 
rested, or rather dropped, his glass upon the table. Well, resumed the Catalan, as he saw the final glimmer of Caderousse's reason vanishing before the last glass of wine. Well, then, I should say, for instance, resumed Danglars, that if, after a voyage such as Dante's has just made, in which he touched at the island of Elba, someone were to denounce him to the king's procurer as a Bonapartist agent. I will denounce him, exclaimed the young man hastily. Yes, but they will make you then sign your declaration and confront you with him you have denounced. I will supply you with the means of supporting your accusation, for I know the fact well. But Dantes cannot remain forever in prison, and one day or other he will leave it. And the day when he comes out, woe betide him who was the cause of his incarceration. Oh, I should like nothing better than he would come and seek a quarrel with me. Yes? And Mercedes? Mercedes, who will detest you if you have only the misfortune to scratch the skin of her dearly beloved Edmund? True, said Fernand. No, no, continued Danglars. If we resolve on such a step, it would be much better to take, as I now do, this pen, dip it into this ink, and write with the left hand, that the writing may not be recognized, the denunciation we propose. And Danglars, uniting practice with theory, wrote with his left hand, and in a writing reversed from his usual style, and totally unlike it, the following lines which he handed to Fernand, and which Fernand read in an undertone. The Honorable, the King's Attorney, is informed by a friend of the throne and religion that one Edmund Dantes, mate of the ship Ferron, arrived this morning from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferraro, has been entrusted by Murat, with a letter for the usurper, and by the usurper with a letter for the Bonapartist Committee in Paris. Proof of this crime will be found on arresting him, for the letter will be found upon him, or at his father's, or in his cabin on board the Ferron. Very good, resumed Danglars. Now your revenge looks like common sense, for in no way can it revert to yourself, and the matter will thus work its own way. There is nothing to do now, but fold the letter as I am doing, and write upon it to the king's attorney. And that's all settled. And Danglars wrote the address as he spoke. "'Yes, that's all settled!' exclaimed Caderousse, who, by a last effort of intellect, had followed the reading of the letter and instinctively comprehended all the misery which such a denunciation must entail. "'Yes, and that's all settled. Only it will be an infamous shame!' And he stretched out his hand to reach the letter. "'Yes,' said Danglars, taking it from beyond his reach. And as what I say and do is merely in jest, and I, amongst the first and foremost, should be sorry if anything happened to Dantes, the worthy Dantes. Look here. And taking the letter, he squeezed it up in his hands and threw it into a corner of the arbor. All right, said Caderousse. Dante's is my friend, and I won't have him ill-used. And who thinks of using him ill? Certainly neither I nor Fernand, said Danglars, rising and looking at the young man who still remained seated, but whose eye was fixed on the denunciatory sheet of paper flung into the corner. In this case, replied Caderousse, Let's have some more wine. I wish to drink to the health of Edmund and the lovely Mercedes. You have had too much already, drunkard, said Danglars. 
and if you continue you will be compelled to sleep here, because unable to stand on your own legs. I? said Caderousse, rising with all the offended dignity of a drunken man. I can't keep my own legs. Why, I'll wager I can go up into the belfry of the Akuls, and without staggering, too. Done, said Danglars. I'll take your bet, but tomorrow. Today it is time to return. Give me your arm and let us go. Very well, let us go, said Caderousse. I don't want your arm at all. Come, Fernand, won't you return to Marseille with us? No, said Fernand. I shall return to the Catalans. You are wrong. Come with us to Marseille. Come along. I will not. What do you mean you will not? Well, just as you like, my prince. There's liberty for all the world. Come along, Danglars, and let the young gentleman return to the Catalans if he chooses. Danglars took advantage of Caderousse's temper at the moment to take him off toward Marseille by the Port Saint-Victor, staggering as he went. When they had advanced about twenty yards, Danglars looked back and saw Fernand stoop, pick up the crumpled paper, and putting it into his pocket then rush out of the arbor towards Pilon. Well, said Caderousse, why, uh, what a lie he told. He said he was going to the Catalans, and he's going to the city. Hello, Fernand! No, you don't see straight, said Danglars. He's gone right enough. Well, said Caderousse, I should have said not. How treacherous wine is. Come, come, said Danglars to himself. Now the thing is at work, and it will affect its purpose unassisted. End of chapter 4 As read by Gordon Mackenzie Troy, Michigan, October 2006
and as dantes was universally beloved on board his vessel the sailors put no restraint on their tumultuous joy at finding that the opinion and choice of their superiors so exactly coincided with their own with the entrance of Monsieur Morel, Donglers and Caderousse were dispatched in search of the bridegroom, to convey to him the intelligence of the arrival of the important personage, whose coming had created such a lively sensation, and to beseech him to make haste. Donglers and Caderousse set off upon their errand at full speed, but ere they had gone many steps they perceived a group advancing towards them, composed of the betrothed pair, a party of young girls in attendance on the bride, by whose side walked Dante's father, the whole brought up by Fernand, whose lips wore their usual sinister smile. Neither Mercedes nor Edmund observed the strange expression of his countenance. They were so happy that they were conscious only of the sunshine and the presence of each other having acquitted themselves of their errand and exchanged a hearty shake of the hand with edmund d'anglers and caderousse took their places behind fernand and old dantes the latter of whom attracted universal notice the old man was attired in a suit of glistening watered silk trimmed with steel buttons beautifully cut and polished his thin but wiry legs were arrayed in a pair of richly embroidered clocked stockings, evidently of English manufacture, while from his three-cornered hat depended a long streaming knot of white and blue ribbons. Thus he came along, supporting himself on a curiously carved stick, his aged countenance lit up with happiness, looking for all the world like one of the aged dandies of 1796, parading the newly opened gardens of the Tuileries and Luxembourg. Beside him glided Caderousse, whose desire to partake of the good things provided for the wedding party had induced him to become reconciled to the Dantes, father and son, although they still lingered in his mind a faint and unperfect recollection of the events of the preceding night, just as the brain retains on waking in the morning the dim and misty outline of a dream. As Donglers approached the disappointed lover, he cast on him a look of deep meaning, while Fernand, as he slowly paced behind the happy pair, who seemed, in their own unmixed content, to have entirely forgotten that such a being as himself existed, was pale and abstracted. Occasionally, however, a deep flush would overspread his countenance, and a nervous contraction distort his features, while, with an agitated and restless gaze, he would glance in the direction of Marseilles, like one who either anticipated to foresee some great and important event. Dantes himself was simply but becomingly clad in the dress peculiar to the merchant service, a costume somewhat between a military and a civil garb, with his fine countenance radiant with joy and happiness, a more perfect specimen of manly beauty could scarcely be imagined. Lovely as the Greek girls of Cyprus or Chios, Mercedes boasted the same bright flashing eyes of jet and ripe round coral lips. She moved with the light, free step of an Arlesian or an Andalusian. One more practiced in the art of great cities would have hid her blushes beneath a veil, or at least have cast down her thickly fringed lashes so as to have concealed the liquid luster of her animated eyes. But on the contrary, the delighted girl looked round her with a smile that seemed to say, If you are my friends, rejoice with me, for I am very happy. As soon as the bridal party came in sight of La Reserve, Monsieur Morel descended and came forth to meet it, followed by the soldiers and sailors there assembled, to whom he had repeated the promise already given, that Dantes should be the successor of the late Captain Leclerc. Edmund, at the approach of his patron, respectfully placed the arm of his affianced bride within that of Monsieur Morel, who, forthwith, conducting her up the flight of wooden steps leading to the chamber in which the feast was prepared, was gaily followed by the guests, beneath whose heavy tread the slight structure creaked and groaned for the space of several minutes. Father, said Mercedes, stopping when she had reached the centre of the table, sit, I pray you, on my right hand. On my left I will place him who has ever been as a brother to me, pointing with a soft and gentle smile to Fernand, but her words and look seemed to inflict the direst torture on him, for his lips became ghastly pale, and even beneath the dark hue of his complexion the blood might be seen retreating as though some sudden pang drove it back to the heart. During this time Dantes, at the opposite side of the table, had been occupied in similarly placing his own honored guests. 
Monsieur Morel was seated at his right hand, Danglars at his left, while, at a sign from Edmund, the rest of the company ranged themselves as they found it most agreeable. Then they began to pass around the dusky piquant Arlesian sausages and lobsters in their dazzling red cuirasses, prawns of large size and brilliant color, the echinus with its prickly outside and dainty morsel within, the clovis, esteemed by the epicures of the south as more than rivaling the exquisite flavor of the oyster, all the delicacies, in fact, that are cast up by the wash of waters on the sandy beach, and styled by the grateful fishermen fruits of the sea. "'A pretty silence, truly,' said the old father of the bridegroom, as he carried to his lips a glass of wine of the hue and brightness of the topaz, and which had just been placed before Mercedes herself. "'Now would anybody think that this room contained a happy, merry party, who desire nothing better than to laugh and dance the hours away?' Ah, sighed Caderousse, a man cannot always feel happy because he is about to be married. The truth is, replied Dantes, that I am too happy for noisy mirth. If that is what you meant by your observation, my worthy friend, you are right. Joy takes a strange effect at times. It seems to oppress us almost the same as sorrow. Danglars looked towards Fernand, whose excitable nature received and betrayed each fresh impression. "'Why, what ails you?' asked he of Edmund. "'Do you fear any approaching evil? "'I should say that you were the happiest man alive at this instant.' "'And that is the very thing that alarms me,' returned Dantes. "'Man does not appear to me to be intended to enjoy felicity so unmixed. "'Happiness is like the enchanted palaces we read of in our childhood, "'where fierce, fiery dragons defend the entrance and approach, "'and monsters of all shapes and kinds requiring to be overcome ere victory is ours. "'I own that I am lost in wonder to find myself promoted to an honor "'of which I feel myself unworthy, that of being the husband of Mercedes.' "'Nay, nay!' cried Caderousse, smiling. "'You have not attained that honor yet. "'Mercedes is not yet your wife. "'Just assume the tone and manner of a husband, "'and see how she will remind you that your hour is not yet come.' "'The bride blushed, while Fernand, restless and uneasy, "'seemed to start at every fresh sound, "'and from time to time wiped away the large drops of perspiration "'that gathered on his brow.' "'Well, never mind that, neighbor Caderousse. "'It is not worth while to contradict me for such a trifle as that. "'Tis true that Mercedes is not actually my wife, but,' added he, drawing out his watch, "'in an hour and a half she will be.' "'A general exclamation of surprise ran around the table, "'with the exception of the elder Dantes, "'whose laugh displayed the still perfect beauty of his large white teeth. "'Mercedes looked pleased and gratified,' while Fernand grasped the handle of his knife with a convulsive clutch. "'In an hour?' inquired Danglars, turning pale. "'How is that, my friend?' "'Why, thus it is,' replied Dantes. "'Thanks to the influence of Monsieur Morel, to whom, next to my father, I owe every blessing I enjoy, every difficulty has been removed. We have purchased permission to waive the usual delay, and at half-past two o'clock the mayor of Marseilles will be waiting for us at the city hall. Now, as a quarter past one has already struck, I do not consider I have asserted too much in saying that, in another hour and thirty minutes, Mercedes will have become Madame Dantes. Fernand closed his eyes, a burning sensation passed across his brow, and he was compelled to support himself by the table to prevent his falling from his chair. But in spite of all his efforts, he could not refrain from uttering a deep groan, which, however, was lost amid the noisy felicitations of the company. "'Upon my word!' cried the old man. "'You make short work of this kind of affair. Arrived here only yesterday morning, and married to-day at three o'clock. Commend me to a sailor for going the quick way to work.' But, asked Danglars in a timid tone, how did you manage about the other formalities, the contract, the settlement? The contract, answered Dantes languidly, it didn't take long to fix that. Mercedes has no fortune. I have none to settle on her. So, you see, our papers were quickly written out, and certainly do not come very expensive. This joke elicited a fresh burst of applause. "'so that what we presume to be merely the betrothal feast "'turns out to be the actual wedding-dinner,' said Danglars. 
"'No, no,' answered Dantes. "'Don't imagine I am going to put you off in that shabby manner. "'Tomorrow morning I start for Paris, four days to go, "'and the same to return, with one day to discharge the commission entrusted to me, "'is all the time I shall be absent. "'I shall be back here by the first of March, "'and on the second I give my real marriage feast.' The prospect of fresh festivity redoubled the hilarity of the guests to such a degree that the elder Dantes, who, at the commencement of the repast, had commented upon the silence that prevailed, now found it difficult, amid the general din of voices, to obtain a moment's tranquillity in which to drink to the health and prosperity of the bride and bridegroom. Dantes, perceiving the affectionate eagerness of his father, responded by a look of grateful pleasure, while Mercedes glanced at the clock and made an expressive gesture to Edmund. Around the table reigned that noisy hilarity which usually prevails at such a time among people sufficiently free from the demands of social position not to feel the trammels of etiquette. Such as at the commencement of the repast had not been able to seat themselves according to their inclination, rose unceremoniously, and sought out more agreeable companions. Everybody talked at once, without waiting for a reply, and each one seemed to be contented with expressing his or her own thoughts. Fernand's paleness appeared to have communicated itself to Dangler's. As for Fernand himself, he seemed to be enduring the tortures of the damned. Unable to rest, he was among the first to quit the table, and, as though seeking to avoid the hilarious mirth that rose in such deafening sounds, he continued, in utter silence, to pace the farther end of the salon. Caderousse approached him just as Dangler's, whom Fernand seemed most anxious to avoid, had joined him in a corner of the room. "'Upon my word,' said Caderousse, from whose mind the friendly treatment of Dante's, united with the effect of the excellent wine he had partaken of, had effaced every feeling of envy or jealousy at Dante's good fortune. "'Upon my word, Dante's is a downright good fellow, and when I see him sitting there beside his pretty wife, that is so soon to be, I cannot help thinking it would have been a great pity to have served him that trick you were planning yesterday.' "'Oh, there was no harm meant,' answered Dangleres. "'At first I certainly did feel somewhat uneasy as to what Fernand might be tempted to do, "'but when I saw how completely he had mastered his feelings, "'even so far as to become one of his rival's attendants, "'I knew there was no further cause for apprehension.' "'Caderousse looked full at Fernand. He was ghastly pale.' Certainly, continued Dangleres, the sacrifice was no trifling one, when the beauty of the bride is concerned. Upon my soul, that future captain of mine is a lucky dog. Gad, I only wish he would let me take his place. Shall we not set forth? asked the sweet silvery voice of Mercedes. Two o'clock has just struck, and you know we are expected in a quarter of an hour. To be sure, to be sure, cried Dantes, eagerly quitting the table. Let us go directly. His words were re-echoed by the whole party with vociferous cheers. At this moment Dangleres, who had been incessantly observing every change in Fernand's look and manner, saw him stagger and fall back with an almost convulsive spasm against a seat placed near one of the open windows. At the same instant his ear caught a sort of indistinct sound on the stairs, followed by the measured tread of soldiery, with the clanking of swords and military accoutrements. Then came a hum and buzz as of many voices, so as to deaden even the noisy mirth of the bridal party, among whom a vague feeling of curiosity and apprehension quelled every disposition to talk, and almost instantaneously the most death-like stillness prevailed. The sounds drew nearer. Three blows were struck upon the panel of the door. The company looked at each other in consternation. "'I demand admittance,' said a loud voice outside the room, "'in the name of the law!' As no attempt was made to prevent it, the door was opened, and a magistrate, wearing his official scarf, presented himself, followed by four soldiers and a corporal. Uneasiness now yielded to the most extreme dread on the part of those present. "'May I venture to inquire the reason of this unexpected visit?' said M. Morel, addressing the magistrate, whom he evidently knew. "'There is doubtless some mistake easily explained.' "'If it is so,' explained the magistrate, "'rely upon every reparation being made. "'Meanwhile I am the bearer of an order of arrest, "'and although I must reluctantly perform the task assigned me, "'it must nevertheless be fulfilled. "'Who among the persons here assembled "'answers to the name of Edmund Dantes?' 
Every eye was turned towards the young man who, spite of the agitation he could not but feel, advanced with dignity and said in a firm voice, "'I am he. What is your pleasure with me?' "'Edmund Dantes,' replied the magistrate, "'I arrest you in the name of the law.' "'Me?' repeated Edmund, slightly changing color. "'And wherefore, I pray?' I cannot inform you, but you will be duly acquainted with the reasons that have rendered such a step necessary at the preliminary examination. Monsieur Morel felt that further resistance or remonstrance was useless. He saw before him an officer delegated to enforce the law, and perfectly well knew that it would be as unavailing to seek pity from a magistrate decked with his official scarf as to address a petition to some cold marble effigy. Old Dantes, however, sprang forward. There are situations which the heart of a father or a mother cannot be made to understand. He prayed and supplicated in terms so moving that even the officer was touched, and, although firm in his duty, he kindly said, My worthy friend, let me beg of you to calm your apprehensions. Your son has probably neglected some prescribed form or attention in registering his cargo, and it is more than probable he will be set at liberty directly he has been given the information required, whether touching the health of his crew or the value of his freight. "'What is the meaning of all this?' inquired Caderousse, frowning on Dangliers, who had assumed the air of utter surprise." "'How can I tell you?' replied he. "'I am, like yourself, utterly bewildered at all that is going on, "'and cannot in the least make out what it is about.' "'Caderousse then looked round for Fernand, but he had disappeared. "'The scene of the previous night now came back to his mind with startling clearness. "'The painful catastrophe he had just witnessed "'appeared effectually to have rent away the veil "'which the intoxication of the evening before "'had raised between himself and his memory.' "'So, so,' said he, in a hoarse and choking voice, to Donglaire's, "'this, then, I suppose, is a part of the trick you were concerting yesterday. "'All I can say is, that if it be so, tis an ill turn, "'and well deserves to bring double evil on those who have projected it.' "'Nonsense,' returned Donglaire's. "'I tell you again, I have nothing whatever to do with it. "'Besides, you know very well that I tore that paper to pieces.' "'No, you did not,' answered Caderousse. "'You merely threw it by. "'I saw it lying in a corner. "'Hold your tongue, you fool. "'What should you know about it? "'Why, you were drunk.' "'Where is Fernand?' inquired Caderousse. "'How do I know?' replied Donglaire's. "'Gone, as every prudent man ought to be, "'to look after his own affairs, most likely. "'Never mind where he is. "'Let you and I go and see what is to be done "'for our poor friends.' During this conversation, Dantes, after having exchanged a cheerful shake of the hand with all his sympathizing friends, had surrendered himself to the officer sent to arrest him, merely saying, "'Make yourself quite easy, my good fellows. There is some little mistake to clear up, that's all. Depend on it. And very likely I may not have to go as so far as the prison to effect that.' "'Oh, to be sure,' responded Donglaire's, who had now approached the group. "'Nothing more than a mistake. I feel quite certain.' Dantes descended the staircase, preceded by the magistrate, and followed by the soldiers. A carriage awaited him at the door. He got in, followed by two soldiers, and the magistrate, and the vehicle drove off towards Marseilles. "'Adieu, adieu, dearest Edmund,' cried Mercedes, stretching out her arm to him from the balcony. The prisoner heard the cry, which sounded like the sob of a broken heart, and leaning from the coach he called out, "'Good-bye, Mercedes. We shall soon meet again.' Then the vehicle disappeared round one of the turnings of Fort St. Nicholas. "'Wait for me here, all of you,' cried Monsieur Morel. "'I will take the first conveyance I find and hurry to Marseilles, whence I will bring you word how all is going on.' "'That's right,' exclaimed a multitude of voices. "'Go, and return as quickly as you can.' This second departure was followed by a long and fearful state of terrified silence on the part of those who were left behind. The old father and Mercedes remained for some time apart, each absorbed in grief. But at length the two poor victims of the same blow raised their eyes, and with a simultaneous burst of feeling rushed into each other's arms. Meanwhile Fernand made his appearance, poured out for himself a glass of water with a trembling hand, then hastily swallowing it, went to sit down at the first vacant place. And this was, by mere chance, placed next to the seat on which Mercedes had fallen half-fainting, when released from the warm and affectionate embrace of old Dantes, 
Instinctively, Fernand drew back his chair. "'He is the cause of all this misery. I am quite sure of it,' whispered Caderousse, who had never taken his eyes off Fernand to Danglars. "'I don't think so,' answered the other. "'He's too stupid to imagine such a scheme. I only hope the mischief will fall upon the head of whoever wrought it.' "'You don't mention those who aided and abetted the deed,' said Caderousse. "'Surely,' answered Danglars, "'one cannot be held responsible for every chance arrow shot into the air.' "'You can, indeed, when the arrow lights pointed downward on somebody's head.' "'Meantime, the subject of the arrest was being canvassed in every different form. "'What think you, Danglars?' said one of the party, turning towards him, "'of this event?' why replied he i think it just possible dantes may have been detected with some trifling article on board ship considered here as contraband but how could he have done so without your knowledge danglars since you are the ship's supercargo why as for that i could only know what i was told respecting the merchandise with which the vessel was laden i know she was loaded with cotton and that she took in her freight at alexandria from prestitt's warehouse and at smyrna from pascal's that is all I was obliged to know, and I beg I may not be asked for any further particulars. Now I recollect, said the afflicted old father, my poor boy told me yesterday he got a small case of coffee and another of tobacco for me. There, you see, exclaimed Danglars, now the mischief is out. Depend upon it, the custom-house people went rummaging about the ship in our absence and discovered poor Dante's hidden treasures. Mercedes, however, paid no heed to this explanation of her lover's arrest. Her grief, which she had hitherto tried to restrain, now burst out in a violent fit of hysterical sobbing. "'Come, come,' said the old man. "'Be comforted, my poor child. There is still hope.' "'Hope,' repeated Danglars. "'Hope,' faintly murmured Ferdinand, but the word seemed to die away on his pale, agitated lips, and a convulsive spasm passed over his countenance." "'Good news! Good news!' shouted forth one of the party stationed in the balcony on the lookout. "'Here comes Monsieur Morel back. No doubt now we shall hear that our friend is released.' Mercedes and the old man rushed to meet the shipowner and greeted him at the door. He was very pale. "'What news?' exclaimed a general burst of voices. "'Alas, my friends,' replied Monsieur Morel, with a mournful shake of his head, "'the thing has assumed a more serious aspect than I expected.' "'Oh, indeed, indeed, sir, he is innocent,' sobbed forth Mercedes. "'That I believe,' answered Monsieur Morel. "'But still he is charged.' "'With what?' inquired the elder Dantes. "'With being an agent of the Bonapartist faction. "'Many of our readers may be able to recollect "'how formidable such an accusation became "'in the period at which our story is dated.' "'A despairing cry escaped the pale lips of Mercedes. "'The old man sank into a chair.' "'Ah, Danglars,' whispered Caderousse, "'you have deceived me. "'The trick you spoke of last night has been played. "'But I cannot suffer a poor old man or an innocent girl "'to die of grief through your fault. "'I am determined to tell them all about it.' "'Be silent, you simpleton,' cried Danglars, "'grasping him by the arm, "'or I will not answer even for your own safety. "'Who can tell whether Dantes be innocent or guilty? "'The vessel did touch at Elba, where he quitted it, "'and passed a whole day in the island. "'Now should any letters or other documents "'of a compromising character be found upon him, "'will it not be taken for granted "'that all who uphold him are his accomplices?' With the rapid instinct of selfishness, Caderousse readily perceived the solidarity of this mode of reasoning. He gazed doubtfully, wistfully on Danglars, and then caution supplanted generosity. "'Suppose we wait a while and see what comes of it,' said he, casting a bewildered look on his companion. "'To be sure,' answered Danglars. "'Let us wait, by all means. If he be innocent, of course he will be set at liberty. If guilty, why, it is no use involving ourselves in a conspiracy.' "'Let us go, then. I cannot stay here any longer.' "'With all my heart,' replied Danglars, pleased to find the other so tractable, "'let us take ourselves out of the way, and leave things for the present to take their course.' After their departure, Fernand, who had now again become the friend and protector of Mercedes, led the girl to her home, while the friends of Dante's conducted the now half-fainting man back to his abode." The rumor of Edmund's arrest as a Bonapartist agent was not slow in circulating throughout the city. 
"'Could you ever have credited such a thing, my dear Donglaires? asked M. Morel, as, on his return to the port, for the purpose of gleaning fresh tidings of Dante's, from M. de Vellefort, the assistant procurer, he overtook his supercargo in Caderousse. "'Could you have believed such a thing possible?' "'Why, you know I told you,' replied Donglaires, "'that I considered the circumstance of his having anchored at the island of Elba "'as a very suspicious circumstance. "'And did you mention these suspicions to any person besides myself?' "'Certainly not,' returned Donglaires, "'then added in a low whisper, "'You understand that, on account of your uncle, "'Monsieur Policar Morel, who served under the other government, "'and who does not altogether conceal what he thinks on the subject, "'you are strongly suspected of regretting the abdication of Napoleon. "'I should have feared to injure both Edmund and yourself "'had I divulged my own apprehensions to a soul. "'I am too well aware that, though a subordinate like myself "'is bound to acquaint the ship-owner with everything that occurs, "'there are many things he ought most carefully to conceal from all else.' "'Tis well, Donglaise, tis well,' replied M. Morel. "'You are a worthy fellow, and I had already thought of your interests "'in the event of poor Edmund having become captain of the Ferron. "'Is it possible you were so kind?' "'Yes, indeed. I had previously inquired of Dante's what was his opinion of you, and if he should have any reluctance to continue you in your post, for somehow I have perceived a sort of coolness between you.' "'And what was his reply?' "'That he certainly did think he had given you offence in an affair which he merely referred to without entering into particulars, but that whoever possessed the good opinion and confidence of the ship's owner would have his preference also.' "'The hypocrite!' murmured Danglars. "'Poor Dantes,' said Caderousse. "'No one can deny his being a noble-hearted young fellow.' "'But meanwhile,' continued M. Morel, "'here is the Ferron without a captain.' "'Oh,' replied Donglaires, "'since we cannot leave this port for the next three months, "'let us hope that, ere the expiration of that period, "'Dantes will be set at liberty.' "'No doubt. But in the meantime?' "'I am entirely at your service, Monsieur Morel,' answered Danglars. "'You know that I am as capable of managing a ship as the most experienced captain in the service, "'and it will be so far advantageous to you to accept my services "'that upon Edmund's release from prison no further charge will be requisite on board the Ferron "'than for Dantes and myself each to resume our respective posts.' "'Thanks, Danglars. That will smooth over all difficulties. "'I fully authorize you at once to assume the command of the Ferron, "'and look carefully to the unloading of her freight. "'Private misfortunes must never be allowed to interfere with business.' "'Be easy on that score, Monsieur Morel. "'But do you think we shall be permitted to see our poor Edmund?' "'I will let you know that directly. "'I have seen Monsieur de Villefort, "'whom I shall endeavour to interest in Edmund's favour. "'I am aware he is a furious royalist, "'but in spite of that, and of his being king's attorney, "'he is a man like ourselves, "'and I fancy not a bad sort of one.' "'Perhaps not,' replied Donglaires, "'but I hear that he is ambitious, "'and that's rather against him.' "'Well, well,' returned Monsieur Morel, "'we shall see.' "'But now hasten on board. "'I will join you there ere long.' "'So saying, the worthy shipowner quitted the two allies "'and proceeded in the direction of the Palais de Justice. "'You see,' said Donglaires, addressing Caderousse, "'the turn things have taken. "'Do you still feel any desire to stand up in his defence? "'Not the slightest. "'But yet it seems to me a shocking thing "'that a mere joke should lead to such consequences.' "'But who perpetrated that joke, let me ask? "'Neither you nor myself, but Ferdinand. "'You knew very well that I threw the paper into the corner of the room. "'Indeed, I fancied I had destroyed it.' "'Oh, no,' replied Caderousse. "'That I can answer for. "'You did not. "'I only wish I could see it now as plainly as I saw it "'lying all crushed and crumpled in a corner of the arbor. "'Well, then, if you did, depend upon it. "'Ferdinand picked it up and either copied it or caused it to be copied.' "'Perhaps, even, he did not take the trouble of recopying it. "'And now I think of it, by heavens, he may have sent the letter himself. "'Fortunately for me, the handwriting was disguised.' "'Then you were aware of Dante's being engaged in a conspiracy?' "'Not I, as I said before. "'I thought the whole thing was a joke, nothing more. "'It seems, however, that I have unconsciously stumbled upon the truth.' still argued caderousse i would give a great deal if nothing of the kind had happened or at least that i had had no hand in it 
"'You will see, Donclairs, that it will turn out an unlucky job for both of us.' "'Nonsense. If any harm come of it, it should fall on the guilty person, and that, you know, is Fernand. How can we be implicated in any way? All we have got to do is to keep our own counsel, and remain perfectly quiet, not breathing a word to any living soul, and you will see that the storm will pass away without in the least affecting us. Amen, responded Caderousse, waving his hand in token of adieu to Danglars, and bending his steps towards the Allées du Milien moving his head to and fro, and muttering as he went, after the manner of one whose mind was overcharged with one absorbing idea. "'So far, then,' said Donclairs mentally, "'all has gone as I would have it. I am temporarily commander of the Ferion, with the certainty of being permanently so, if that fool of a Caderousse can be persuaded to hold his tongue. My only fear is the chance of Dante's being released.' "'But there he is in the hands of justice, and,' admitted he with a smile, "'she will take her own.' "'So saying, he leaped into a boat, desiring to be rowed on board the Ferron, "'where Monsieur Morel had agreed to meet him.'" End of chapter 5「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J.C. Guan, Montreal, May 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 6. The Deputy Procureur du Roi. In one of the aristocratic mansions built by Puget in the Rue du Grand Cour opposite the Medusa Fountain, a second marriage feast was being celebrated, almost at the same hour with the nuptial repast given by Dantes. In this case, however, although the occasion of the entertainment was similar, the company was strikingly dissimilar. Instead of a rude mixture of sailors, soldiers, and those belonging to the humblest grade of life, the present assembly was composed of the very flower of Marseille society, magistrates who had resigned their office during the usurper's reign, officers who had deserted from the imperial army and joined forces with Condé, and the younger members of families brought up to hate and execrate the man whom five years of exile would convert into a martyr, and fifteen of restoration elevate to the rank of a god. The guests were still at table and the heat and an energetic conversation that prevailed betrayed the violent and vindictive passions that then agitated each dweller of the south where unhappily for five centuries religious strife had long given increased bitterness to the violence of party feeling the emperor now king of the petty island of elba after having held sovereign sway over one half of the world counting as his subjects a small population of five or six thousand souls after having been accustomed to hear the vive napoleons of a hundred and twenty millions of human beings uttered in ten different languages was looked upon here as a ruined man separated for ever from any fresh connection with france or claim to her throne the magistrates freely discussed their political views the military part of the company talked unreservedly of moscow and leipzig while the women commented on the divorce of josephine it was not over the downfall of the man but over the defeat of the napoleonic idea that they rejoiced and in this they foresaw for themselves the bright and cheering prospect of a revivified political existence an old man decorated with the cross of saint louis now rose and proposed the health of king louis eighteenth it was the marquis de saint meran this toast recalling at once the patient exile of hartwell and the peace-loving king of france excited universal enthusiasm glasses were elevated in the air à l'anglais and the ladies snatching their bouquet from their fair bosoms strewed the table with their floral treasures in a word an almost poetical fervor prevailed ah said the marquise de saint meran a woman with a stern forbidding eye though still noble and distinguished in appearance despite her fifty years 
are these revolutionists who have driven us from those very possessions they afterwards purchased for a mere trifle during the reign of terror would be compelled to own were they hear that all true devotion was on our side since we were content to follow the fortunes of a falling monarch while they on the contrary made their fortune by worshipping the rising sun yes yes they could not help admitting that the king for whom we sacrificed rank wealth and station was truly our louis the well-beloved while their wretched usurper has been and ever will be to them their evil genius their napoleon the accursed am i not right villefort i beg your pardon madame i really must pray you to excuse me but in truth i was not attending to the conversation marquise marquise interposed the old nobleman who had proposed the toast let the young people alone let me tell you on one's wedding day they are more agreeable subjects of conversation than dry politics never mind dearest mother said a young and lovely girl with a profusion of light brown hair and eyes that seemed to float in liquid crystal it is all my fault for seizing upon Monsieur de Villefort so as to prevent his listening to what you said. But there, now take him. He is your own for as long as you like, Monsieur Villefort. I beg to remind you, my mother speaks to you. If the Marquise will deign to repeat the words I but imperfectly caught, I shall be delighted to answer, said Monsieur de Villefort. Never mind, René, replied the Marquise with a look of tenderness that seemed out of keeping with her harsh, dry features. But, however all other feelings may be withered in a woman's nature, there is always one bright, smiling spot in the desert of her heart, and that is the shrine of maternal love. I forgive you. What I was saying, Villefort, was that the Bonapartists had not our sincerity, enthusiasm, or devotion. They had, however, what supplied the place of those fine qualities replied the young man and that was fanaticism napoleon is the mahomet of the west and is worshipped by his commonplace but ambitious followers not only as a leader and lawgiver but also as the personification of equality he cried the marquise napoleon the type of equality for mercy's sake then what would you call robespierre come come do not strip the latter of his just rights to bestow them on the corsican who to my mind has urged quite enough nay madame i would place each of these heroes on his right pedestal that of robespierre on his scaffold in the place louis XV, that of napoleon on the column of the place vendome the only difference consists in the opposite character of the equality advocated by these two men one is the equality that elevates the other is the equality that degrades one brings a king within reach of the guillotine the other elevates the people to a level with the throne observe said villefort smiling i do not mean to deny that both these men were revolutionary scoundrels and that the ninth thermidor and the fourth of april in the year eighteen fourteen were lucky days for france worthy of being gratefully remembered by every friend to monarchy and civil order and that explains how it comes to pass that fallen as i trust he is for ever napoleon has still retained a train of parasitical satellites still marquise it has been so with other usurpers cromwell for instance who was not half so bad as napoleon had his partisans and advocates do you know Bilfort, that you are talking in a most dreadfully revolutionary strain but i excuse it it is impossible to expect the son of a girondin to be free from a small spice of the old leaven a deep crimson suffused the countenance of Villefort. "'Tis true, madame,' answered he, "'that my father was a Girondin, "'but he was not among the number of those "'who voted for the king's death. "'He was an equal sufferer with yourself "'during the reign of terror, "'and had well nigh lost his head "'on the same scaffold on which your father perished.' "'True,' replied the Marquis, "'without wincing in the slightest degree "'at the tragic remembrance thus called up. But bear in mind, if you please, that our respective parents underwent persecution and proscription from diametrically opposite principles, in proof of which I may remark that while my family remained among the stanchest adherents of the exiled princes, your father lost no time in joining the new government, and that while the citizen Noirtier was a Girondin, the Count Noirtier became a senator. Dear mother, interposed René, you know very well it was agreed that all these disagreeable reminiscences should forever be laid aside 
Suffer me also, madame, replied Villefort, to add my earnest request to Mademoiselle de Mérance, that you will kindly allow the veil of oblivion to cover and conceal the past. What avails recrimination over matters wholly past recall? I have laid aside even the name of my father, and altogether disowned his political principles. He was, nay, probably may still be, a Bonapartist, and is called Noirtier. I, on the contrary, am a stand royalist, and style myself de Villefort. Let what may remain of revolutionary sap exhaust itself and die away with the old trunk, and condescend only to regard the young shoot which has started up at a distance from the parent tree, without having the power, any more than the wish, to separate entirely from the stock from which it sprung. Bravo, Villefort, cried the Marquis. Excellently well said. Come now, I have hopes of obtaining what I have been for years endeavouring to persuade the Marquise to promise, namely a perfect amnesty and forgetfulness of the past. With all my heart, replied the Marquise, let the past be for ever forgotten. I promise you it affords me as little pleasure to revive it as it does you. All I ask is that Villefort will be firm and inflexible for the future in his political principles. Remember also, Villefort, that we have pledged ourselves to his majesty for your filthy and strict loyalty, and that, at our recommendation, the king consented to forget the past as I do. And here she extended to him her hand, as I now do at your entreaty. But bear in mind that should there fall in your way any one guilty of conspiring against the government, you will be so much the more bound to visit the offence with rigorous punishment, as it is known you belong to a suspected family. Alas, madame, returned Villefort, my profession, as well as the times in which we live, compels me to be severe. I have already successfully conducted several public prosecutions, and brought the offenders to merited punishment. But we have not done with the thing yet. Do you indeed think so? inquired the Marquise. I am at least fearful of it. Napoleon, in the island of Elba, is too near France, and his proximity keeps up the hopes of his partisans. Marseille is filled with half prey officers, who are daily, under one frivolous pretext or another, getting up quarrels with the royalists. From hence arise continual and fatal duels among the highest classes of persons, and assassinations in the lower. You have heard, perhaps, said the Comte de Salvieux, one of Monsieur de Méran's oldest friends, and trembling to the Comte d'Artois, that the Holy Alliance purposed removing him from thence? Yes, they were talking about it when we left Paris, said Monsieur de saint Méran. And where is it decided to transfer him? To St. Helena. For heaven's sake, where is that? asked the Marquise. An island situated on the other side of the equator, at least two thousand leagues from here, replied the Count. So much the better. As Villefort observes, it is a great act of folly to have left such a man between Corsica, where he was born, and Naples, of which his brother-in-law is king, and face to face with Italy, the sovereignty of which he coveted for his son. Unfortunately, said Villefort, there are the treaties of 1814, and we cannot molest Napoleon without breaking those compacts. Oh, well. We shall find some way out of it, responded M. de Salvieux. There wasn't any trouble over treaties when it was a question of shooting the poor Duc d'Anguien. Well, said the Marquise, it seems probable that, by the aid of the Holy Alliance, we shall be rid of Napoleon, and we must trust to the vigilance of M. de Villefort to purify Marseille of his partisans. The king is either a king or no king, if he be acknowledged a sovereign of France he should be upheld in peace and tranquillity, and this can best be effected by employing the most inflexible agents to put down every attempt at conspiracy. It is the best and surest means of preventing mischief. Unfortunately, madame, answered Villefort, the strong arm of the law is not called upon to interfere until the evil has taken place. Then all he has got to do is to endeavor to repair it. Nay, madame, the law is frequently powerless to effect this. All it can do is to avenge the wrong done. Oh, Monsieur de Villefort, cried the beautiful young creature, daughter to the Comte de Salvier, and a cherished friend of Mademoiselle de saint Méran. Do try and get up some famous trial while we are at Marseille. I never was in a law court, 
I am told it is so very amusing. Amusing, certainly, replied the young man, inasmuch as instead of shedding tears at the fictitious tale of woe produced at the theatre, you behold in a law court a case of real and genuine distress, a drama of life. The prisoner whom you dare see pale, agitated, and alarmed, instead of, as is the case when a curtain falls on a tragedy, going home to sup peacefully with his family, and then retiring to rest, that he may recommend his mimic woes on the morrow, is removed from your sight merely to be reconducted to his prison and delivered up to the executioner. I leave you to judge how far your nerves are calculated to bear you through such a scene. Of this, however, be assured, that should any favorable opportunity present itself, I will not fail to offer you the choice of being present. For shame, Monsieur de Villefort, said René, becoming quite pale. Don't you see how you're frightening us? And yet you laugh. What would you have? Tis like a duel. I have already recorded sentence of death, five or six times, against the movers of political conspiracies, and who can say how many daggers may be ready sharpened? and only awaiting a favorable opportunity to be buried in my heart. Gracious heavens, Monsieur de Villefort, said René, becoming more and more terrified. You surely are not in earnest. Indeed I am, replied the young magistrate with a smile. And in the interesting trial that young lady is anxious to witness, the case would only be still more aggravated. Suppose, for instance, the prisoner, as is more than probable, to have served under Napoleon, well, can you expect for an instant that one accustomed at the word of his commander to rush fearlessly on the very bayonets of his foe, will scruple more to drive a stiletto into the heart of one he knows to be his personal enemy, than to slaughter his fellow creature merely because bidden to do so by one he is bound to obey? Besides, one requires the excitement of being hateful in the eyes of the accused, in order to lash oneself into a state of sufficient vehemence and power. I would not choose to see the man against whom I pleaded smile, as though in mockery of my words. No, my pride is to see the accused pale, agitated, and as though beaten out of all composure by the fire of my eloquence. René uttered a smothered exclamation. Bravo, cried one of the guests. That is what I call talking to some purpose. Just the person we require at a time like the present, said a second. What a splendid business that last case of yours was, my dear Villefort, remarked a third. I mean the trial of the man for murdering his father. Upon my word, you killed him ere the executioner had laid his hand upon him. Oh, as for parasites and such dreadful people as that, interposed René, it matters very little what is done to them. But as regards poor unfortunate creatures whose only crime consists in having mixed themselves up in political intrigues, why, that is the very worst offense they could possibly commit. For don't you see, René, the king is the father of his people, and he who shall plot or contrive aught against the life and safety of the parent of thirty-two million of souls is a parasite upon a fearfully great scale. I don't know anything about that, replied René, but, Monsieur de Villefort, you have promised me, have you not, always to show mercy to those I plead for. Make yourself quite easy on that point, answered Villefort, with one of his sweetest smiles. You and I will always consult upon our verdicts. My love, said the Marquise, attend to your doves, your lapdogs, and embroidery, but do not meddle with what you do not understand. Nowadays the military profession is in abeyance, and the magisterial robe is the badge of honor. There is a wise Latin proverb that is very much in point. Sedant arma toge, said Villefort with a bow. I cannot speak Latin, responded the Marquise. Well, said René, I cannot help regretting you had not chosen some other profession than your own. A physician, for instance. Do you know I always felt a shudder at the idea of even then destroying Angel? Dear good René, whispered Villefort, as he gazed with unutterable tenderness on the lovely speaker. Let us hope, my child, cried the Marquis, that Monsieur de Villefort may prove the moral and political physician of this province. If so, he will have achieved a noble work, and one which will go far to efface the recollection of his father's conduct, added the incorrigible Marquise. Madame, replied Villefort with a mournful smile, I have already had the honor to observe that my father has, at least I hope so, abjured his past errors, and that he is, at the present moment, a firm and zealous friend of the religion and order. 
a better royalist possibly than his son for he has to atone for past dereliction while i have no other impulse than warm decided preference and conviction having made this well-turned speech villefort looked carefully round to mark the effect of his oratory much as he would have done had he been addressing the bench in open court do you know my dear villefort cried the comte de salieu that is exactly what i myself said the other day at the tuileries when questioned by his majesty's principal chamberlain touching the singularity of an allegiance between the son of a girondin and the daughter of an officer of the duc de conde and i assure you he seemed fully to comprehend that this mode of reconciling political differences was based upon sound and excellent principles then the king who without our suspecting it had overheard our conversation interrupted us by saying Villefort, observe that the king did not pronounce the word Nortier, but, on the contrary, placed considerable emphasis on that of Villefort. Villefort, said his majesty, is a young man of great judgment and discretion, who will be sure to make a figure in his profession. I like him much, and it gave me great pleasure to hear that he was about to become the son-in-law of the Marquis and Marquise de saint Méran. I should myself have recommended the match, had not the noble marquis anticipated my wishes by requesting my consent to it is it possible the king could have condescended so far as to express himself so favourably of me asked the enraptured villefort i give you his very words and if the marquis chooses to be candid he will confess that they perfectly agree with what his majesty said to him when he went six months ago to consult him upon the subject of your espousing his daughter that is true answered the marquis how much do I owe this gracious prince? What is there I would not do to evince my earnest gratitude? That is right, cried the Marquise. I love to see you thus. Now then, were a conspirator to fall into your hands, he would be most welcome. For my part, dear mother, interposed René, I trust your wishes will not prosper, and that Providence will only permit petty offenders, poor debtors, and miserable cheats to fall into Monsieur de Villefort's hands. Then I shall be contented just the same as though you prayed that a physician might only be called upon to prescribe for headaches measles and a string of wasp or any other slight affection of the epidermis if you wish to see me the king's attorney you must desire for me some of those violent and dangerous diseases from the cure of which so much honour redounds to the physician at this moment and as though the utterance of villefort's wish had sufficed to effect its accomplishment a servant entered the room and whispered a few words in his ear. Villefort immediately rose from table, and quitted the room upon the plea of urgent business. He soon, however, returned, his whole face beaming with delight. René regarded him with fond affection, and certainly his handsome features, lit up as they then were with more than usual fire and animation, seemed formed to excite the innocent admiration with which she gazed on her graceful and intelligent lover. You were wishing just now, said Villefort, addressing her, that I were a doctor instead of a lawyer. Well, I at least resemble the disciples of Euskalipius, in one thing, that of not being able to call a day my own, not even that of my betrothal. And wherefore were you called away just now? asked Mademoiselle de saint Méran with an air of deep interest. For a very serious matter, which bids fair to make work for the executioner. How dreadful! exclaimed René, turning pale. Is it possible? burst simultaneously from all who were near enough to the magistrate to hear his words. Why, if my information proved correct, a sort of Bonaparte conspiracy had just been discovered. Can I believe my ears? cried the Marquise. I will read you the letter containing the accusation, at least, said Villefort. The king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and the religious institutions of his country that one named Edmond Dantes, mate of the ship Pharaon, this day arrived from Smyrna, after having touched at Naples and Porto Ferraro, has been the bearer of a letter from Murat to the usurper, and again taken charge of another letter from the usurper to the Bonapartist club in Paris. Ample corroboration of this statement may be obtained by arresting the above-mentioned Edmond Dantes, who either carries the letter for Paris about with him, or has it at his father's abode. Should it not be found in the possession of father or son, then it will assuredly be discovered in the cabin belonging to the said Dantes on board the Pharaon. 
But, said René, this letter, which after all is but an anonymous scrawl, is not even addressed to you, but to the king's attorney. True, but that gentleman being absent, his secretary, by his orders, opened his letters. Thinking this one of importance, he sent for me, but not finding me, took upon himself to give the necessary orders for arresting the accused party. Then the guilty person is absolutely in custody, said the Marquise. Nay, my dear mother, say the accused person. You know we cannot yet pronounce him guilty. He is in safe custody, answered Villefort, and rely upon it. If the letter is found, he will not be likely to be trusted abroad again, unless he goes forth under the special protection of the headsman. And where is the unfortunate being? asked René. He is at my house. Come, come, my friend, interrupted the Marquise. Do not neglect your duty to linger with us. You are the king's servant, and must go wherever that service calls you. Oh, Villefort, cried Renée, clasping her hands and looking toward her lover with piteous earnestness, be merciful on this day of our betrothal. The young man passed round to the side of the table, where the fair pleader sat, and leaning over her chair said tenderly, To give you pleasure, my sweet Renée, I promise you to show all the lenity in my power. But if the charges brought against this Bonapartist hero prove correct, why then you really must give me leave to order his head to be cut off. Renée shuddered. Never mind that foolish girl, Villefort, said the Marquise. She will soon get over these things. So saying, Madame de Saint Méran extended her dry bony hand to Villefort, who, while imprinting a son in law's respectful salute on it, looked at Renée as much as to say, I must try and fancy tis your dear hand I kiss, as it should have been. These are mournful auspices to accompany a betrothal, sighed poor Renée. Upon my words, child, exclaimed the angry Marquise, your folly exceeds all bounds. I should be glad to know what connection there can possibly be between your sickly sentimentality and the affairs of state. Oh, mother, murmured Renée. Nay, madame, I pray you pardon this little traitor. I promise you that to make up for her want of loyalty, I will be most inflexibly severe. Then casting an expressive glance at his betrothed, which seemed to say, Fear not, for your dear sake my justice shall be tempered with mercy. And receiving a sweet and approving smile in return, Villefort quitted the room. End of chapter 6 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by J.C. Guan, Montreal, May 2007. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 7 The Examination. No sooner had Villefort left the salon than he assumed the grave air of a man who holds the balance of life and death in his hands. Now, in spite of the mobility of his countenance, the command of which, like a finished actor, he had carefully studied before the glass, it was by no means easy for him to assume an air of judicial severity. Except the recollection of the line of politics his father had adopted, and which might interfere unless he acted with the greatest prudence with his own career, Gérard de Villefort was as happy as a man could be. Already rich, he held a high official situation, though only twenty-seven. He was about to marry a young and charming woman, whom he loved, not passionately, but reasonably, as became a deputy attorney of the king. And besides her personal attractions, which were very great, Mademoiselle de saint Méran's family possessed considerable political influence, which they would, of course, exert in his favor. The dowry of his wife amounted to fifty thousand crowns, and he had besides the prospect of seeing her fortune increased to half a million at her father's death these considerations naturally gave villefort a feeling of such complete felicity that his mind was fairly dazzled in its contemplation at the door he met the commissary of police who was waiting for him the sight of this officer recalled villefort from the third heaven to earth he composed his face as we have before described and said i have read the letters sir and you have acted rightly in arresting this man. Now inform me what you have discovered concerning him and the conspiracy. We know nothing as yet of the conspiracy, monsieur, 
All the papers found have been sealed up and placed on your desk. The prisoner himself is named Edmond Dantes, mate on board the Three Master de Pharaon, trading in cotton with Alexandria and Smyrna, and belonging to Morel and Son of Marseille. Before he entered the merchant service, has he ever served in the Marines? Oh, no, monsieur, he is very young. How old? Nineteen or twenty at the most. At this moment, and as Villefort had arrived at the corner of the Rue des Conseils, a man who seemed to have been waiting for him approached. It was M. Morel. Ah, M. de Villefort, cried he, I am delighted to see you. Some of your people have committed the strangest mistake. They have just arrested Edmond Dantes, mate of my vessel. I know it, monsieur, replied Villefort, and I am now going to examine him. Oh, said Morel, carried away by his friendship, you do not know him, and I do. He is the most estimable, the most trustworthy creature in the world, and I will venture to say there is not a better seaman in all the merchant service. Oh, monsieur de Villefort, I beseech your indulgence for him. Villefort, as we have seen, belonged to the aristocratic party at Marseille, Morel to the plebeian. The first was a royalist, the other suspected of Bonapartism. Villefort looked disdainfully at Marel, and replied, You are aware, monsieur, that a man may be estimable and trustworthy in private life, and the best seaman in the merchant service, and yet be, politically speaking, a great criminal, is it not true? The magistrate laid emphasis on these words, as if he wished to apply them to the owner himself, while his eyes seemed to plunge into the heart of one who, interceding for another, had himself need of indulgence. Morel reddened, for his own conscience was not quite clear on politics. Besides, what Dantes had told him of his interview with the Grand Marshal, and what the Emperor had said to him, embarrassed him. He replied, however, I entreat you, Monsieur de Villefort, be as you always are kind and equitable, and give him back to us soon. This give us sound and revolutionary in the deputy's ears. Ah, ah, murmured he, is Dantes then a member of some carbonary society, that his protector thus employs the collective form? He was, if I recollect, arrested in a tavern, in company of a great many others. Then he added, Monsieur, you may rest assured I shall perform my duty impartially, and that if he be innocent, you shall not have appealed to me in vain. Should he, however, be guilty, in this present epoch, immunity would furnish a dangerous example, and I must do my duty. As he had now arrived at the door of his own house, which adjoined the Palais de Justice, he entered after having coldly saluted the shipowner who stood, as if petrified, on the spot where Villefort had left him. The antechamber was full of police agents and gendarmes, in the midst of whom, carefully watched, but calm and smiling, stood the prisoner. Villefort traversed the antechamber, cast a side glance at Dantes, and taking a packet which a gendarme offered him, disappeared, saying, Bring the prisoner. Rapid as had been Villefort's glance, it had served to give him an idea of the man he was about to interrogate. He had recognized intelligence in the high forehead, courage in the dark eye and bent brow, and frankness in the thick lips that showed a set of pearly teeth. Villefort's first impression was favorable, but he had been so often warned to mistrust first impulses that he applied the maxim to the impression, forgetting the difference between the two words. He stifled, therefore, the feelings of compassion that were rising, composed his features, and sat down, grim and somber, at his desk. An instant after Dantes entered, he was pale but calm and collected, and saluting his judge with easy politeness, looked round for a seat, as if he had been in M. Morel's salon. It was then that he encountered the first time Villefort's look, that look peculiar to the magistrate, who, while seeming to read the thoughts of others, betrays nothing of his own. "'Who and what are you?' demanded Villefort, turning over a pile of papers containing information relative to the prisoner that a police agent had given to him on his entry and that already in an hour's time had swelled to voluminous proportions, thanks to the corrupt espionage of which the accused is always made the victim. My name is Edmond Dantes, replied the young man calmly. I am mate of the Pharaon, belonging to Messieurs Morel and Son. Your age, continued Villefort. Nineteen, returned Dantes, 
What were you doing at the moment you were arrested? I was at the festival of my marriage, monsieur, said the young man, his voice slightly tremulous. So great was the contrast between that happy moment and the painful ceremony he was now undergoing. So great was the contrast between the sombre aspect of Monsieur de Villefort and the radiant face of Mercedes. You were at the festival of your marriage, said the deputy, shuddering in spite of himself. Yes, monsieur. I am on the point of marrying a young girl I have been attached to for three years. Before, impassive as he was, was struck with this coincidence, and the tremulous voice of Dantès, surprised in the midst of his happiness, struck a sympathetic chord in his own bosom. He also was on the point of being married, and he was summoned from his own happiness to destroy that of another. This philosophic reflection, thought he, will make a great sensation at M. de saint Mérance and he arranged mentally, while Dantès awaited further questions, the antithesis by which orators often create a reputation for eloquence. When the speech was arranged, Villefort turned to Dantès. "'Go on, sir,' said he. "'What would you have me say?' "'Give all the information in your power. "'Tell me on which point you desire information, and I will tell all I know. "'Only,' added he with a smile, I warn you, I know very little. Have you served under the usurper? I was about to be mustered into the Royal Marines when he fell. It is reported your political opinions are extreme, said Villefort, who had never heard anything of the kind, but was not sorry to make this inquiry, as if it were an accusation. My political opinions, replied Dantès. Alas, sir, I never had any opinions. I am hardly nineteen. I know nothing. I have no part to play. If I obtain the situation I desire, I shall owe it to Monsieur Morel. Thus all my opinions, I will not say public but private, are confined to these three sentiments. I love my father, I respect Monsieur Morel, and I adore Mercedes. This, sir, is all I can tell you, and you see how uninteresting it is. As Dantès spoke, Villefort gazed at his ingenuous and open countenance, and recollected the words of René who, without knowing who the culprit was, had besought his indulgence for him. With the deputy's knowledge of crime and criminals, every word the young man uttered convinced him more and more of his innocence. This lad, for he was scarcely a man, simple, natural, eloquent, with that eloquence of the heart never found when sought for, full of affection for everybody, because he was happy, and because happiness renders even the wicked good, extended his affection even to his judge, in spite of Villefort's severe look and stern accent. Dantès seemed full of kindness. Pardieu, said Villefort, he is a noble fellow. I hope I shall gain Renée's favor easily by obeying the first command she ever imposed on me. I shall have at least a pressure of the hand in public, and a sweet kiss in private. Full of this idea, Villefort's face became so joyous that when he turned to Dantès, the latter, who had watched the change on his physiognomy, was smiling also. Sir, said Villefort, have you any enemies, at least that you know? I have enemies, replied Dantès. My position is not sufficiently elevated for that. As for my disposition, that is perhaps somewhat too hasty, but I have striven to repress it. I have had ten or twelve sailors under me, and if you question them, they will tell you that they love and respect me not as a father, for I am too young, but as an elder brother. But you may have excited jealousy. You are about to become captain at nineteen, an elevated post. You are about to marry a pretty girl, who loves you, and these two pieces of good fortune may have excited the envy of someone. You are right. You know men better than I do, and what you say may possibly be the case, I confess, but if such persons are among my acquaintances, I prefer not to know it, because then I should be forced to hate them. You are wrong. You should always strive to see clearly around you. You seem a worthy young man. I will depart from the strict line of my duty to aid you in discovering the author of this accusation. Here is the paper. Do you know the writing? As he spoke, Villefort drew the letter from his pocket and presented it to Dantès. Dantès read it. A cloud passed over his brow as he said, No, monsieur, I do not know the writing and yet it is tolerably plain. Whoever did it writes well. I am very fortunate, added he, looking gratefully at Villefort, to be examined by such a man as you, for this envious person is a real enemy. 
and by the rapid glance that the young man's eyes shot forth, Villefort saw how much energy lay hid beneath this mildness. Now, said the deputy, answer me frankly, not as a prisoner to a judge, but as one man to another who takes an interest in him. What truth is there in the accusation contained in this anonymous letter? And Villefort drew disdainfully on his desk the letter Dantès had just given back to him. None at all. I will tell you the real facts. I swear by my honor as a sailor, by my love for Mercedes, by the life of my father. Speak, monsieur, said Villefort. Then internally, if Renée could see me, I hope she would be satisfied, and would no longer call me a decapitator. Well, when we quit at Naples, Captain Leclerc was attacked with a brain fever. As we had no doctor on board, and he was so anxious to arrive at Elba that he would not touch at any other port, his disorder rose to such a height that at the end of the third day, feeling he was dying, he called me to him. My dear Dantès, said he, swear to perform what I am going to tell you, for it is a matter of the deepest importance. I swear, Captain, replied I. Well, as after my death the command devolves on you as mate, assume the command and bear up for the island of Elba, disembark at Porto Ferraro, ask for the Grand Marshal, give him this letter, perhaps they will give you another letter, and charge you with a commission. You will accomplish what I was to have done, and derive all the honor and profit from it. I will do it, Captain, but perhaps I shall not be admitted to the Grand Marshal's presence as easily as you expect. Here is a ring that will obtain audience of him, and remove every difficulty, said the captain. At these words he gave me a ring. It was time. Two hours after he was delirious. The next day he died. And what did you do then? What I ought to have done, and what every one would have done in my place. Everywhere the last requests of a dying man are sacred, but with a sailor the last requests of his superior are commands. I sailed for the island of Elba, where I arrived the next day. I ordered everybody to remain on board, and went on shore alone. As I had expected, I found some difficulty in obtaining access to the Grand Marshal, but I sent the ring I had received from the captain to him, and was instantly admitted. He questioned me concerning Captain Leclerc's death, and, as the latter had told me, gave me a letter to carry on to a person in Paris. I undertook it because it was what my captain had bade me to do. I landed here, regulated the affairs of the vessel, and hastened to visit my affianced bride, whom I found more lovely than ever. Thanks to Monsieur Morel, all the forms were got over. In a word I was, as I told you, at my marriage feast, and I should have been married in an hour, and tomorrow I intended to start for Paris had I not been arrested on this charge which you as well as I now see to be unjust. Ah, said Villefort, this seems to me the truth. If you have been culpable, it was imprudence, and this imprudence was in obedience to the orders of your captain. Give up this letter you have brought from Elba, and pass your word you will appear should you be required, and go and rejoin your friends. Am I free then, sir? cried Dantes joyfully. Yes, but first give me this letter. You have it already, for it was taken from me, with some others which I see in that packet. Stop a moment, said the deputy, as Dantes took his hat and gloves. To whom is it addressed? To Monsieur Noirtier, Rue Coqueron, Paris. Had a thunderbolt fallen into the room, Villefort could not have been more stupefied. He sank into his seat, and hastily turned over the packet, drew forth the fatal letter at which he glanced with an expression of terror. Monsieur Noirtier, Rue Coqueron, number 13, murmured he, growing still paler. Yes, said Dantès. Do you know him? No, replied Villefort. A faithful servant of the king does not know conspirators. It is a conspiracy, then, asked Dantès, who, after believing himself free, now began to feel a tenfold alarm. I have, however, already told you, sir, I was entirely ignorant of the contents of the letter. Yes, but you knew the name of the person to whom it was addressed, said Villefort. I was forced to read the address to know to whom to give it. Have you shown this letter to anyone? asked Villefort, becoming still more pale. To no one, on my honor. Everybody is ignorant that you are the bearer of a letter from the island of Elba, and addressed to Monsieur Noirtier? Everybody, except the person who gave it to me. 
and that was too much, far too much, murmured Villefort. Villefort's brow darkened more and more. His white lips and clenched teeth filled Dantes with apprehension. After reading the letter, Villefort covered his face with his hands. Oh, said Dantes timidly, what is the matter? Villefort made no answer, but raised his head at the expiration of a few seconds, and again perused the letter. And you say that you are ignorant of the contents of this letter? I give you my word of honor, sir, said Dantes. But what is the matter? You are ill. Shall I ring for assistance? Shall I call? No, said Villefort, rising hastily. Stay where you are. It is for me to give orders here, and not you. Monsieur, replied Dantes proudly, it was only to summon assistance for you. I want none. It was a temporary indisposition. Attend to yourself. Answer me. Dantes waited, expecting a question, but in vain. Villefort fell back on his chair, passed his hand over his brow, moist with perspiration, and, for the third time, read the letter. Oh, if he only knows the contents of this, murmured he, and that Noirtier is the father of Villefort, I am lost and he fixed his eyes upon Edmond as if he would have penetrated his thoughts. "'Oh, it is impossible to doubt it,' cried he suddenly. "'In heaven's name!' cried the unhappy young man. "'If you doubt me, question me, I will answer you.' Villefort made a violent effort, and in a tone he strove to render firm. "'Sir,' said he, "'I am no longer able, as I have hoped, to restore you immediately to liberty. Before doing so, I must consult the trial justice.' What my own feelings is, you already know. Oh, monsieur, cried Dantes, you have been rather a friend than a judge. Well, I must detain you some time longer, but I will strive to make it as short as possible. The principal charge against you is this letter, and you see, Villefort approached the fire, cast it in, and waited until it was entirely consumed. You see, I destroy it? Oh, exclaimed Dantes, you are goodness itself. Listen, continued Villefort, you can now have confidence in me after what I have done. Oh, command, and I will obey. Listen, this is not a command, but advice I give you. Speak, and I will follow your advice. I shall detain you until this evening in the Palais de Justice. Should anyone else interrogate you, say to him what you have said to me, but do not breathe a word of this letter. I promise. It was Villefort who seemed to entreat, and the prisoner who reassured him. You see, continued he, glancing toward the grate, where fragments of burnt paper fluttered in the flames. The letter is destroyed. You and I alone know of its existence. Should you therefore be questioned, deny all knowledge of it, deny it boldly, and you are saved. Be satisfied, I will deny it. It was the only letter you had? It was. Swear it. I swear it. Villefort rang. A police agent entered. Villefort whispered some words in his ear, to which the officer replied by a motion of his head. Follow him, said Villefort to Dantes. Dantes saluted Villefort and retired. Hardly had the door closed when Villefort threw himself half fainting into a chair. Alas, alas, murmured he, if the procureur himself had been at Marseilles, I should have been ruined. This accursed letter would have destroyed all my hopes. Oh, my father, must your past career always interfere with my successes? Suddenly a light passed over his face, a smile played round his set mouth, and his haggard eyes were fixed in thought. This will do, said he, and from this letter which might have ruined me, I will make my fortune. Now to the work I have in hand, and after having assured himself that the prisoner was gone, the deputy procureur hastened to the house of his betrothed. End of chapter 7 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma. Green, K-R-I, dot com. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 8. The Chateau D. The commissary of police, as he traversed the antechamber, made a sign to two gendarmes, who placed themselves one on Dante's right and the other on his left. 
a door that communicated with the Palais de Justice was opened, and they went through a long range of gloomy corridors, whose appearance might have made even the boldest shudder. The Palais de Justice communicated with the prison, a sombre edifice that from its grated windows looked on the clock tower of the Accoules. After numberless windings, Dante saw a door with an iron wicket. The commissary took up an iron mallet and knocked thrice, every blow seeming to Dante as if struck on his heart. The door opened, the two gendarmes gently pushed him forward, and the door closed with a loud sound behind him. The air he inhaled was no longer pure, but thick and mephitic. He was in prison. He was conducted to a tolerably neat chamber, but grated and barred, and its appearance, therefore, did not greatly alarm him. Besides, the words of Villefort, who seemed to interest himself so much, resounded still in his ears like a promise of freedom. It was four o'clock when Dante was placed in this chamber. It was, as we have said, the first of March, and the prisoner was soon buried in darkness. The obscurity augmented the acuteness of his hearing. At the slightest sound he rose and hastened to the door, convinced they were about to liberate him. But the sound died away, and Dante sank again into his seat. At last, about ten o'clock, and just as Dante began to despair, steps were heard in the corridor. A key turned in the lock. The bolts creaked, and the massy oaken door flew open, and a flood of light from two torches pervaded the apartment. By the torchlight Dante saw the glittering sabres and carbines of four gendarmes. He had advanced at first, but stopped at the sight of this display of force. "'Are you come to fetch me?' asked he. Yes, replied a gendarme. By the orders of the deputy procureur? I believe so. The conviction that they came from Monsieur de Villefort relieved all Dante's apprehensions. He advanced calmly and placed himself in the centre of the escort. A carriage waited at the door, the coachman was on the box, and a police officer sat beside him. Is this carriage for me? said Dante. It is for you, replied the gendarme. Dante was about to speak, but feeling himself urged forward, and having neither the power nor the intention to resist, he mounted the steps, and was in an instant seated inside between two gendarmes. The two others took their places opposite, and the carriage rolled heavily over the stones. The prisoner glanced at the windows. They were grated. He had changed his prison for another that was conveying him, he knew not whither. Through the grating, however, Dante saw they were passing through the rue Casserie, and by the rue Saint-Laurent, and the rue Tagami to the port. Soon he saw the light of La Consigne. The carriage stopped, the officer descended, approached the guard-house. A dozen soldiers came out and formed themselves in order. Dante saw the reflection of their muskets by the light of the lamps on the quay. "'Can all this force be summoned on my account?' thought he. The officer opened the door, which was locked, and without speaking a word answered Dante's question. For he saw between the ranks of the soldiers a passage formed from the carriage to the port. The two gendarmes who were opposite to him descended first. Then he was ordered to alight, and the gendarmes on each side of him followed his example. They advanced towards a boat, which a custom-house officer held by a chain near the quay. The soldiers looked at Dantes with an air of stupid curiosity. In an instant he was placed in the stern sheets of the boat, between the gendarmes, while the officer stationed himself at the bow. A shove sent the boat adrift, and four sturdy oarsmen impelled it rapidly towards the pilon. A shout from the boat, the chain that closes the mouth of the port, was lowered, and in a second they were, as Dantes knew, in the Frioul, outside the inner harbour. The prisoner's first feeling was of a joy at again breathing the pure air, for air is freedom. But he soon sighed, for he passed before La Réserve, where he had that morning been so happy, and now through the open windows came the laughter and revelry of a ball. Dante folded his hands, raised his eyes to heaven, and prayed fervently. The boat continued her voyage.
They had passed the Tête de Mort, were now off the Anse de Faro, and about to double the battery. This maneuver was incomprehensible to Dante. "'Whither are you taking me?' asked he. "'You will soon know.' "'But, but still, we are forbidden to give you any explanation.' Dante, trained in discipline, knew that nothing would be more absurd than to question subordinates, who were forbidden to reply. And so he remained silent. The most vague and wild thoughts passed through his mind. The boat they were in could not make a long voyage. There was no vessel at anchor outside the harbor. He thought, perhaps, they were going to leave him on some distant point. He was not bound, nor had they made any attempt to handcuff him. This seemed good augury. Besides, had not the deputy, who had been so kind to him, told him that provided he did not pronounce the dreaded name of Noirtier, he had nothing to apprehend? Had not Villefort in his presence destroyed the fatal letter, the only proof against him? He waited silently, striving to pierce through the darkness. They had left the Ile Ratonneau, where the lighthouse stood on the right, and were now opposite the Point des Catalans. It seemed to the prisoner that he should distinguish a feminine form on the beach, for it was there Mercedes dwelt. How was it that a presentiment did not warn Mercedes that her lover was within three hundred yards of her? One light alone was visible, and Dante saw that it came from Mercedes' chamber. Mercedes was the only one awake in the whole settlement. A loud cry could be heard by her, but pride restrained him, and he did not utter it. What would his guards think if they had heard him shout like a madman? He remained silent, his eyes fixed upon the light. The boat went on, but the prisoner thought only of Mercedes. An intervening elevation of land hid the light. Dante turned and perceived that they had gone out to sea. While he had been absorbed in thought, they had shipped their oars and hoisted sail. The boat was now moving with the wind. In spite of his repugnance to address the guards, Dante turned to the nearest gendarme, and, taking his hand, Comrade, said he, I adjure you, as a Christian and a soldier, to tell me where we are going. I am Captain Dante, a loyal Frenchman, though accused of treason. Tell me where you are conducting me, and I promise you, on my honor, I will submit to my fate. The gendarme looked irresolutely at his companion, who returned for an answer a sign that said, I see no great harm in telling him now. The gendarme replied, You are a native of Marseille and a sailor, and yet you do not know where you are going? On my honor I have no idea. Have you no idea whatever? None at all. That is impossible. I swear to you it is true. Tell me, I entreat. But my orders. Your orders do not forbid you telling me what I must know in ten minutes, in half an hour, or an hour. You see I cannot escape, even if I intended. Unless you are blind or have never been outside the harbor, you must know. I do not. Look round you, then. Dante rose and looked forward when he saw rise within a hundred yards of him the black and frowning rock on which stands the Chateau d'I. This gloomy fortress, which has for more than three hundred years furnished food for so many wild legends, seemed to Dante like a scaffold to a malefactor. The Chateau d'I? cried he. What are we going there for? The gendarme smiled. I am not going there to be imprisoned, said Dante. It is only used for political prisoners. I have committed no crime. Are there any magistrates or judges at the Chateau d'If? There are only, said the gendarme, a governor, a garrison, turnkeys, and good thick walls. Come, come, do not look so astonished, or you will make me think you are laughing at me in return for my good nature. Dante pressed the gendarme's hand as though he would crush it. You think then, said he, that I am taken to the Chateau d'If to be imprisoned there? <laughs> it is probable, but there is no occasion to squeeze so hard. Without any inquiry, without any formality? All the formalities have been gone through. The inquiry is already made. 
and so, in spite of Monsieur de Villefort's promises... I do not know what Monsieur de Villefort promised you, said the gendarme, but I know we are taking you to the Chateau d'If. But what are you doing? Help! Comrade, help! By a rapid movement which the gendarme's practiced eye had perceived, Dante sprang forward to precipitate himself into the sea. But four vigorous arms seized him as his feet quitted the bottom of the boat. He fell back, cursing with rage. Good, said the gendarme, placing his knee on his chest. Believe, soft-spoken gentleman, again. Hark ye, my friend, I have disobeyed my first order, but I will not disobey the second. And if you move, I will blow your brains out. And he leveled his carbine at Dante, who felt the muzzle against his temple. For a moment, the idea of struggling crossed his mind, and of so ending the unexpected evil that had overtaken him. But he bethought him of Monsieur de Villefort's promises, and besides, death in a boat from the hand of a gendarme seemed too terrible. He remained motionless, but gnashing his teeth and wringing his hands with fury. At this moment the boat came to a landing with a violent shock. One of the sailors leaped on shore, a cord creaked as it ran through a pulley, and Dante guessed they were at the end of the voyage, and that they were mooring the boat. His guards, taking him by the arms and coat collar, forced him to rise, and dragged him towards the steps that led to the gate of the fortress, while the police officer, carrying a musket with fixed bayonet, followed behind. Dante made no resistance. He was like a man in a dream. He saw soldiers drawn up on the embankment. He knew vaguely that he was ascending a flight of steps. He was conscious that he passed through a door, and that the door closed behind him, but all this indistinctly as through a mist. He did not even see the ocean, that terrible barrier against freedom which the prisoners look upon with utter despair. They halted for a minute, during which he strove to collect his thoughts. He looked around. He was in a court surrounded by high walls. He heard the measured tread of sentinels, and as they passed before the light, he saw the barrels of their muskets shine. They waited upwards of ten minutes. Certain Dante could not escape, the gendarmes released him. They seemed awaiting orders. The orders came. "'Where is the prisoner?' said a voice. "'Here,' replied the gendarmes. "'Let him follow me. I will take him to his cell.' "'Go,' said the gendarmes, thrusting Dante forward. The prisoner followed his guide, who led him into a room almost underground, whose bare and reeking walls seemed as though impregnated with tears. A lamp placed on a stool illumined the apartment faintly, and showed Dante the features of his conductor, an under-jailer, ill-clothed, and of sullen appearance. "'Here is your chamber for to-night,' said he. "'It is late, and the governor is asleep. Tomorrow, perhaps, he may change you. In the meantime there is bread, water, and fresh straw, and that is all a prisoner can wish for. Good night.' And before Dante could open his mouth, before he had noticed where the jailer placed his bread or the water, before he glanced towards the corner where the straw was, the jailer disappeared, taking with him the lamp and closing the door, leaving stamped upon the prisoner's mind the dim reflection of the dripping walls of his dungeon. Dante was alone in darkness and in silence cold as the shadows that he felt breathe on his burning forehead. With the first dawn of day the jailer returned, with orders to leave Dante where he was. He found the prisoner in the same position, as if fixed there, his eyes swollen with weeping. He had passed the night standing and without sleep. The jailer advanced. Dante appeared not to perceive him. He touched him on the shoulder. Edmund started. "'Have you not slept?' said the jailer. "'I do not know,' replied Dante. The jailer stared. "'Are you hungry?' continued he. "'I do not know.' "'Do you wish for anything?' "'I wish to see the governor.' The jailer shrugged his shoulders and left the chamber. 
Dante followed him with his eyes, and stretched forth his hands toward the open door. But the door closed. All his emotion then burst forth. He cast himself on the ground, weeping bitterly, and asking himself what crime he had committed that he was thus punished. The day passed thus. He scarcely tasted food, but walked round and round the cell like a wild beast in his cage. One thought in particular tormented him, namely that during his journey hither he had sat so still, whereas he might a dozen times have plunged into the sea, and thanks to his powers of swimming for which he was famous have gained the shore, concealed himself until the arrival of a Genoese or Spanish vessel, escaped to Spain or Italy, where Mercedes and his father could have joined him. He had no fears as to how he should live. Good seamen are welcome everywhere. He spoke Italian like a Tuscan and Spanish like a Castilian. He would have been free and happy with Mercedes and his father, whereas now he was confined in the Chateau d'If, that impregnable fortress, ignorant of the future destiny of his father and Mercedes and all this because he had trusted to Villefort's promise. The thought was maddening, and Dante threw himself furiously down on his straw. The next morning, at the same hour, the jailer came again. "'Well,' said the jailer, "'are you more reasonable to-day?' Dante made no reply. "'Come, cheer up. Is there anything that I can do for you?' "'I wish to see the governor.' I have already told you, it is impossible. Why so? Because it is against prison rules, and prisoners must not even ask for it. What is allowed, then? Better fare if you pay for it, books, and leave to walk about. I do not want books. I am satisfied with my food, and do not care to walk about. But I wish to see the governor. If you worry me by repeating the same thing, I will not bring you any more to eat. Well then, said Edmund, if you do not, I shall die of hunger, that is all. The jailer saw by his tone he would be happy to die, and as every prisoner is worth ten sous a day to his jailer, he replied in a more subdued tone. What you ask is impossible, but if you are very well behaved you will be allowed to walk about, and some day you will meet the governor and if he chooses to reply, that is his affair. But, asked Dante, how long shall I have to wait? A month, six months, a year. It is too long a time. I wish to see him at once. Ah, said the jailer, do not always brood over what is impossible, or you will be mad in a fortnight. You think so? Yes, we have an instance here. It was by always offering a million francs to the governor for his liberty that an abbey became mad who was in this chamber before you. How long has he left it? Two years. Was he liberated then? No, he was put in a dungeon. Listen, said Dante, I am not an abbe, I am not mad. Perhaps I shall be, but at present, unfortunately, I am not. I will make you another offer. What is that? I do not offer you a million, because I have it not. But I will give you a hundred crowns if, the first time you go to Marseille, you will seek out a young girl named Mercedes at the Catalans, and give her two lines from me. If I took them and were detected, I should lose my place, which is worth two thousand francs a year, so that I should be a great fool to run such a risk for three hundred. Well, said Dante, mark this. If you refuse at least to tell Mercedes I am here, I will some day hide myself behind the door, and when you enter I will dash out your brains with this stool. Threats! cried the jailer, retreating and putting himself on the defensive. You are certainly going mad. The abbe began like you, and in three days you will be like him, mad enough to tie up, but fortunately there are dungeon here. Dante whirled the stool round his head. All right, all right, said the jailer, all right, since you will have it so, I will send word to the governor. Very well, returned Dante, dropping the stool and sitting on it, as if he were in reality mad. The jailer went out, and returned in an instant with a corporal and four soldiers. By the governor's orders, said he, conduct the prisoner to the tier beneath. To the dungeon, then, said the corporal. 
Yes, we must put the madman with the madmen. The soldiers seized Dante, who followed passively. He descended fifteen steps, and the door of a dungeon was opened, and he was thrust in. The door closed, and Dante advanced with outstretched hands until he touched the wall. He then sat down in the corner until his eyes became accustomed to the darkness. The jailer was right. Dante wanted but little of being utterly mad. End of chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 9 The Evening of the Betrothal. Villefort had, as we have said, hastened back to Madame de Saint Marin's in the Place de Grandcourt, and on entering the house found that the guests whom he had left at table were taking coffee in the salon. Rene was, with all the rest of the company, anxiously awaiting him and his entrance was followed by a general exclamation. "'Well, decapitator, guardian of the state, royalist, brutus, what is the matter?' said one. "'Speak out.' "'Are we threatened with a fresh reign of terror?' asked another. "'Has the Corsican ogre broken loose?' cried a third. "'Marquise,' said Villefort, approaching his future mother-in-law, "'I request your pardon for thus leaving you. Will the Marquis honour me by a few moments' private conversation?' "'Ah, it is really a serious matter, then?' asked the Marquis, remarking the cloud on Villefort's brow. "'So serious that I must take leave of you for a few days. So,' added he, turning to René, "'judge for yourself, if it be not important.' "'You're going to leave us?' cried René, unable to hide her emotion at this unexpected announcement. "'Alas,' returned Villefort, "'I must.' "'Where, then, are you going?' asked the Marquise. "'That, madam, is an official secret. "'But if you have any commissions for Paris, "'a friend of mine is going there to-night, "'and will with pleasure undertake them.' "'The guests looked at each other. "'You wish to speak to me alone?' said the Marquis. "'Yes, let us go to the library, please.' "'The Marquis took his arm, and they left the salon. "'Well,' asked he, as soon as they were by themselves, "'tell me what it is. "'An affair of the greatest importance "'that demands my immediate presence in Paris.' Now excuse the indiscretion, Marquis, but have you any landed property? All my fortune is in the funds, seven or eight hundred thousand francs. Then sell out, sell out, Marquis, or you will lose it all. But how can I sell out here? You have a broker, have you not? Yes. Then give me a letter to him, and tell him to sell out without an instant's delay. Perhaps even now I shall arrive too late. The deuce, you say, replied the Marquis. Let us lose no time, then and sitting down he wrote a letter to his broker, ordering him to sell out at the market price. "'Now then,' said Villefort, placing the letter in his pocket-book, "'I must have another. To whom? To the king. To the king? Yes. I dare not write to his majesty. I do not ask you to write to his majesty, but ask Monsieur de Servieux to do so. I want a letter that will enable me to reach the king's presence without all the formalities of demanding an audience.' that would occasion a loss of precious time. But address yourself to the keeper of the seals. He has the right of entry at the Tuileries, and can procure you audience at any hour of the day or night. Doubtless, but there is no occasion to divide the honours of my discovery with him. The keeper would leave me in the background, and take all the glory to himself. I tell you, Marquis, my fortune is made if I only reach the Tuileries the first, for the king will not forget the service I do him. In that case, go and get ready. I will call Selvieux and make him write the letter. Be as quick as possible. I must be on the road in a quarter of an hour. Tell your coachman to stop at the door. You will present my excuses to the Marquise and Mademoiselle René, whom I leave on such a day with great regret. You will find them both here, and can make your farewells in person. A thousand thanks, and now for the letter. The Marquis rang, a servant entered. Say to the Comte de Servieux that I would like to see him. Now then, go, said the Marquis. I shall be gone only a few moments. Villefort hastily quitted the apartment, 
but reflecting that the sight of the deputy procurer running through the streets would be enough to throw the whole city into confusion, he resumed his ordinary pace. At his door he perceived a figure in the shadow that seemed to wait for him. It was Mercedes, who, hearing no news of her lover, had come unobserved to inquire after him. As Villefort drew near, she advanced and stood before him. Dante had spoken of Mercedes, and Villefort instantly recognized her. Her beauty and high bearing surprised him, and when she inquired what had become of her lover, it seemed to him that she was the judge and he the accused. "'The young man you speak of,' said Villefort abruptly, "'is a great criminal, and I can do nothing for him, mademoiselle.' Mercedes burst into tears, and as Villefort strove to pass her, again addressed him. "'But at least tell me where he is, that I may know whether he is alive or dead,' said she. "'I do not know. He is no longer in my hands.' replied Villefort. And desirous of putting an end to the interview, he pushed by her and closed the door, as if to exclude the pain he felt. But remorse is not thus banished. Like Virgil's wounded hero, he carried the arrow in his wound, and arrived at the salon, Villefort uttered a sigh that was almost a sob, and sank into a chair. Then the first pangs of an unending torture seized upon his heart. The man he sacrificed to his ambition, that innocent victim immolated on the altar of his father's faults, appeared to him pale and threatening, leading his affianced bride by the hand and bringing with him remorse, not such as the ancients figured, furious and terrible, but that slow and consuming agony whose pangs are intensified from hour to hour up to the very moment of death. Then he had a moment's hesitation. He had frequently called for capital punishment on criminals, and owing to his irresistible eloquence they had been condemned, and yet the slightest shadow of remorse had never clouded Villefort's brow, because they were guilty, at least he believed so. But here was an innocent man, whose happiness he had destroyed. In this case he was not the judge, but the executioner. As he thus reflected, he felt the sensation we have described, and which had hitherto been unknown to him, arise in his bosom, and fill him with vague apprehensions. It is thus that a wounded man trembles instinctively, at the approach of the finger to his wound, until it be healed. But Villefort's was one of those that never close, or if they do, only close to reopen more agonizing than ever. If at this moment the sweet voice of René had sounded in his ears, pleading for mercy, or the fair Mercedes had entered and said, In the name of God, I conjure you to restore me my affianced husband, his cold and trembling hands would have signed his release. But no voice broke the stillness of the chamber, and the door was opened only by Villefort's valet, who came to tell him that the travelling carriage was in readiness. Villefort rose, or rather sprang from his chair, hastily opened one of the drawers of his desk, emptied all the gold it contained into his pocket, stood motionless an instant, his hand pressed to his head, muttering a few inarticulate sounds, and then, Perceiving that his servant had placed his cloak upon his shoulders, he sprang into the carriage, ordering the postillions to drive to Monsieur de saint Marin's. The hapless Dante was doomed. As the Marquis had promised, Villefort found the Marquise and René in waiting. He started when he saw René, for he fancied she was again about to plead for Dante. Alas, her emotions were wholly personal. She was thinking only of Villefort's departure. She loved Villefort and he left her at the moment he was about to become her husband. Villefort knew not when he should return, and René, far from pleading for Dante, hated the man whose crime separated her from her lover. Meanwhile, what of Mercedes? She had met Fernand at the corner of the Rue de la Loge. She had returned to the Catalan, and had despairingly cast herself on her couch. Fernand, kneeling by her side, took her hand, and covered it with kisses, that Mercedes did not even feel, she passed the night thus. The lamp went out for want of oil, but she paid no heed to the darkness, and dawn came, but she knew not that it was day. Grief had made her blind to all but one object. That was Edmond. "'Ah, you are there,' said she, at length, turning towards Fernand. "'I have not quitted you since yesterday,' returned Fernand sorrowfully. Monsieur Morel had not readily given up the fight. He had learned that Dante had been taken to prison, and he had gone to all his friends, and the influential persons of the city. But the report was already in circulation that Dante was arrested as a Bonapartist agent, and as the most sanguine looked upon any attempt of Napoleon to remount the throne as impossible, 
he met with nothing but refusal, and had returned home in despair, declaring that the matter was serious, and that nothing more could be done. Carderousse was equally restless and uneasy, but instead of seeking, like M. Morel, to aid Dante, he had shut himself up with two bottles of black currant brandy, in the hope of drowning reflection. But he did not succeed, and became too intoxicated to fetch any more drink, and yet not so intoxicated as to forget what had happened. With his elbows on the table he sat between the two empty bottles, while spectres danced in the light of the unsnuffed candle. Spectres such as Hoffman strews over his punch-drunk pages like black, fantastic dust. Danglars alone was content and joyous. He had got rid of an enemy, and made his own situation on the Ferron secure. Danglars was one of those men born with a pen behind the ear, and an inkstand in place of a heart. Everything with him was multiplication or subtraction. The life of a man was to him of far less value than a numeral, especially when, by taking it away, he could increase the sum total of his own desires. He went to bed at his usual hour, and slept in peace. Villefort, after receiving M. de Saveux's letter, embraced René, kissed the Marquise's hand, and shaken that of the Marquis, started for Paris along the X road. Old Dante was dying with anxiety to know what had become of Edmond, but we know very well what had become of Edmond. End of chapter 9 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 10 The King's Closet at the Tuileries. We will leave Villefort on the road to Paris, travelling, thanks to trebled fees, with all speed, and passing through two or three apartments. Enter at the Tuileries the little room with the arched window, so well known as having been the favorite closet of Napoleon in Louis the Eighteenth, and now of Louis Philippe. There, seated before a walnut table he had brought with him from Hartwell, and to which, from one of those fancies not uncommon to great people, he was particularly attached, the king, Louis the Eighteenth, was carelessly listening to a man of fifty or fifty-two years of age with grey hair, aristocratic bearing, and exceedingly gentlemanly attire, and meanwhile making a marginal note in a volume of Gryphius's rather inaccurate but much sought-after edition of Horace, a work which was much indebted to the sagacious observations of the philosophical monarch. "'You say, sir,' said the king, "'that I am exceedingly disquieted, sire.' "'Really, have you had a vision of the seven fat kine and the seven lean kine?' No, sire, for that would only be token for us seven years of plenty, and seven years of scarcity, and with a king as full of foresight as your majesty, scarcity is not a thing to be feared. Then of what other scourge are you afraid, my dear Blaca? Sire, I have every reason to believe that a storm is brewing in the south. Well, my dear duke, replied Louis the Eighteenth, I think you are wrongly informed, and know positively that, on the contrary, it is very fine weather in that direction. Man of ability, as he was, Louis the Eighteenth liked a pleasant jest. Sire, continued M. de Blacas, if it only be to reassure a faithful servant, will your majesty send into Languedoc, Provence, and Dauphine trusty men, who will bring you back a faithful report as to the feeling in these three provinces? Canonis Surdis, replied the king continuing the annotations in his Horace. Sire, replied the courtier, laughing, in order that he might seem to comprehend the quotation, your majesty may be perfectly right in relying on the good feeling of France, but I fear I am not altogether wrong in dreading some desperate attempt. By whom? By Bonaparte, or at least by his adherents. My dear Blaca, said the king, you with your alarms prevent me from working. And you, sire, prevent me from sleeping with your security. Wait, my dear sir, wait a moment, for I have such a delightful note on the pastor cum traheret. Wait, and I will listen to you afterwards. There was a brief pause, during which Louis the Eighteenth wrote, in a hand as small as possible, 
another note on the margin of his Horace, and then looking at the Duke with an air of a man who thinks he has an idea of his own, while he is only commenting upon the idea of another, said, "'Go on, my dear Duke, go on, I listen.' "'Sire,' said Blaca, who had for a moment the hope of sacrificing Villefort to his own profit, I am compelled to tell you that these are not mere rumours destitute of foundation which thus disquiet me, but a serious-minded man, deserving all my confidence, and charged by me to watch over the South, the Duke hesitated as he pronounced these words, has arrived by post to tell me that a great pearl threatens the King, and so I hasten to you, sire. Maladusis savi domum, continued Louis the Eighteenth, still annotating. "'Does your Majesty wish me to drop the subject?' "'By no means, my dear Duke, but just stretch out your hand. "'Which? Whichever you please. There, to the left. "'Here, sire? I tell you to the left, and you are looking to the right. "'I mean on my left. Yes, there. "'You will find yesterday's report of the Minister of Police. "'But here is Monsieur Dandre himself.' "'And Monsieur Dandre, announced by the Chamberlain-in-waiting, entered. "'Come in.' said Louis the Eighteenth with repressed smile. Come in, Baron, and tell the Duke all you know, the latest news of Monsieur de Bonaparte. Do not conceal anything, however serious. Let us see. The island of Elba is a volcano, and we may expect to have issuing thence flaming and bristling war. Bella, horrida Bella. Monsieur Dandre leaned very respectfully on the back of a chair with his two hands, and said, Has your Majesty perused yesterday's report? But tell the Duke himself, who cannot find anything, what the report contains. Give him the particulars of what the usurper is doing in his islet. Monsieur, said the Baron to the Duke, all the servants of His Majesty must approve of the latest intelligence which we have from the island of Elba. Bonaparte, Monsieur Dandre looked at Louis the Eighteenth, who employed in writing a note, did not even raise his head. Bonaparte, continued the Baron, is mortally wearied, and passes whole days in watching his miners at work at Porto Longoni, and scratches himself for amusement, added the king. Scratches himself? inquired the duke. What does your majesty mean? Yes, indeed, my dear duke, did you forget that this great man, this hero, this demigod, is attacked with a malady of the skin which worries him to death? Perigo? And moreover, my dear Duke, continued the Minister of Police, we are almost assured that, in a very short time, the usurper will be insane. Insane? Raving mad. His head becomes weaker. Sometimes he weeps bitterly. Sometimes laughs boisterously. At other time, he passes hours on the seashore, flinging stones in the water, and when the flint makes duck and drake five or six times, he appears as delighted as if he had gained another Marengo or Austerlitz. Now you must agree that these are indubitable symptoms of insanity. Or of wisdom, my dear Baron, or of wisdom, said Louis the Eighteenth, laughing. The greatest captains of antiquity amused themselves by casting pebbles into the ocean. See Plutarch's life of Scipio Africanus. Monsieur de Blaca pondered deeply between the confident monarch and the truthful minister. Villefort, who did not choose to reveal the whole secret, lest another should reap all the benefit of the disclosure, had yet communicated enough to cause him the greatest uneasiness. "'Well, well, Dandre,' said Louis the Eighteenth, "'Blaca is not yet convinced. Let us proceed, therefore, to the usurper's conversion.' The minister of police bowed. "'The usurper's conversion,' murmured the duke, looking at the king and Dandre, who spoke alternately like Virgil's shepherds. "'The usurper converted?' "'Decidedly, my dear Duke. "'In what way converted? "'Two good principles. "'Tell him all about it, Baron.' "'Why, this is the way of it,' said the minister, "'with the gravest air in the world. "'Napoleon lately had a review, "'and as two or three of his old veterans "'expressed a desire to return to France, "'he gave them their dismissal, "'and exhorted them to serve the good king. "'These were his own words. "'Of that I am certain. "'Well, Blaca. "'What do you think of this?' inquired the king triumphantly, and pausing for a moment from the voluminous goliast before him. "'I say, sire, that the minister of police is greatly deceived, or I am. 
and as it is impossible it can be the minister of police as he has the guardianship of the safety and honour of your majesty it is probable that i am in error however sire if i might advise your majesty will interrogate the person of whom i spoke to you and i will urge your majesty to do him this honour most willingly duke under your auspices i will receive any person you please but you must not expect me to be too confiding baron have you any report more recent than this dated the twentieth february this is the fourth of march no sire but i am hourly expecting one it may have arrived since i left my office go thither and if there be none well well continued louis the eighteenth make one that is the usual way is it not and the king laughed facetiously oh sire replied the minister we have no occasion to invent any every day our desks are loaded with most circumstantial denunciations coming from hosts of people who hope for some return for services which they seek to render but cannot they trust to fortune and rely upon some unexpected event in some way to justify their predictions well sir go said louis the eighteenth and remember that i am waiting for you i will but go and return sire i shall be back in ten minutes and i sire said m de blacas will go and find my messenger wait sir wait said louis the eighteenth really m de blacas i must change your armorial bearings i will give you an eagle with outstretched wings holding in its claws a prey which tries in vain to escape and bearing this device tanax sire i listen said de blacas biting his nails with impatience i wish to consult you on this passage Molly fugien angelitu you know it refers to a stag flying from a wolf are you not a sportsman and a great wolf hunter well then what do you think of the Molly angelitu admirable sire but my messenger is like the stag you refer to for he has posted two hundred and twenty leagues in scarcely three days which is undergoing great fatigue and anxiety my dear duke when we have a telegraph which transmits messages in three or four hours and that without getting in the least out of breath ah sire you recompense but badly this poor young man who has come so far and with so much ardour to give your majesty useful information if only for the sake of m de Servieux, who recommends him to me i entreat your majesty to receive him graciously m de Servieux, my brother's chamberlain yes sire he is at marseilles and writes me thence does he speak to you of this conspiracy no but strongly recommends m de villefort and begs me to present him to your majesty m de villefort cried the king is the messenger's name m de villefort yes sire and he comes from marseilles in person why did you not mention his name at once replied the king betraying some uneasiness sire i thought his name was unknown to your majesty no no blaca he is a man of strong and elevated understanding ambitious too and pardieu you know his father's name his father yes noirtier noirtier the girondine noirtier the senator he himself and your majesty has employed the son of such a man blaca my friend you have but limited comprehension i told you villefort was ambitious and to attain this ambition Villefort would sacrifice everything, even his father. Then, sire, may I present him? This instant, duke, where is he? Waiting below in my carriage. Seek him at once. I hasten to do so. The duke left the royal presence with the speed of a young man. His really sincere royalism made him youthful again. Louis the Eighteenth remained alone, and turning his eyes on his half-opened Horace, muttered, Justum et tenacem propositi verum. M. de Blacas returned as speedily as he had departed, but in the antechamber he was forced to appeal to the king's authority. Villefort's dusty garb, his costume, which was not of courtly cut, excited the susceptibility of M. de Braise, who was all astonishment at finding that this young man had the audacity to enter before the king in such attire the duke however overcame all difficulties with a word his majesty's order and in spite of the protestations which the master of ceremonies made for the honour of his office and principles villefort was introduced the king was seated in the same place where the duke had left him 
On opening the door, Villefort found himself facing him, and the young magistrate's first impulse was to pause. "'Come in, Monsieur de Villefort,' said the king. "'Come in.' Villefort bowed, and advancing a few steps, waited until the king should interrogate him. "'Monsieur de Villefort,' said Louis the Eighteenth. The Duc de Blacas assures me you have some interesting information to communicate. Sire, the Duke is right, and I believe your Majesty will think it equally important. In the first place, and before everything else, sir, is the news as bad in your opinion as I am asked to believe? Sire, I believe it to be most urgent, but I hope, by the speed I have used, that it is not irreparable. Speak as fully as you please, sir, said the King who began to give way to the emotion which had showed itself in Blacas's face and affected Villefort's voice. "'Speak, sir, and pray begin at the beginning. I like order in everything.' "'Sire,' said Villefort, "'I will render a faithful report to your majesty, but I must entreat your forgiveness if my anxiety leads to some obscurity in my language.' A glance at the king after this discreet and subtle exordium assured Villefort of the benignity of his august auditor, and he went on. "'Sire, I have come as rapidly to Paris as possible, to inform your majesty that I have discovered, in the exercise of my duties, not a commonplace and insignificant plot, such as is every day got up in the lower ranks of the people and in the army, but an actual conspiracy, 